Hi, this is Libby. And this is Roberta. And this is Art Blog Radio. This morning we're speaking with Gary Stoyer. Gary is the Chief Cultural Officer for the City of Philadelphia. Gary is the in the mayor's cabinet, we believe, and he directs the city's arts efforts out of his office. He has over 30 years of experience in arts management and policy. He sat down with Gary in 2009 when his office was in the nosebleed section of City Hall up on the seventh floor. We didn't even know City Hall had a seventh floor with office space. He, but he's moved now, and he's been the art czar for four years, we call him the arts are, affectionately, and we want to find out more about how he thinks the art sector of Philadelphia is doing. So thanks for being here this morning, Gary. You're welcome. I'm excited to be here. Great. <laughs> and I am in the cabinet. I should clarify oh, that. Oh, yes. excellent. I'm so glad <laughs> so we got that, that right. Cool. So we want to talk to you a little bit about the gallery. We're sitting in an office that's next to the gallery, and right now you have a show about the mummers in it. So tell us a little bit about how that show got here and who comes to your gallery. Sure. Well, the, uh, the art gallery came about because, uh, as you and your listeners probably know, City Hall has had an Art and City Hall program for many years, which really has, has focused on juried exhibitions that, uh, because of the nature of City Hall, has had to be displayed in display cases on the second and fourth floor, which has required the public to clear security to get to those areas of City Hall, which are only accessible by going through the security checkpoint. So we were able to work with the Public Property Department of City Hall, which is sort of our building manager, uh, to identify the space we're in now, which is Room 116, which uh, had been used as the Mayor's Action Center. Uh, so it was, uh, which was basically like the phone bank or, or the, the, the walk-in office. If people had a problem with the city, this is where they would come to sort of express their complaint, ask their question. And uh, when the city's 311 system was created, it absorbed that operation, so this space became available. And, and who comes in here? The art gallery is really visited by the full, broad cross-section of the public. It's, uh, I think it's one of the great things about being on the first floor of City Hall is that it's very, very accessible, it's very visible, it's right near the visitor center. So when people are going on a City Hall tour, uh, they check in in a space that adjoins the office. And, and often there's a wait for going on the city hall tours. So you get people who come who are tourists who visit the city. They want to go on a city hall tour. They've got to wait 45 minutes before the next tour. And the gallery becomes a perfect opportunity to experience art. We try to use the gallery space in a way that is sort of civic-minded, that's not trying to kind of compete with or replace the functions of the many you know, art galleries that we have in the city already, but really looks at what it, we have a special role as a as a city office in the gallery, and so we try and use it to partner with other arts organizations to tell stories about other aspects of the city, about certain kinds of things that are going on in the city. So, for example, we we have the current exhibit that's about the Mummers that is a partnership with the Mummers Museum. Uh, and right now the juried exhibition, the Art and City Hall exhibition, is an exhibition of art by artists who are inspired by the Mummers. So you have a lot of competing groups who are interested in the work that your office does and mm. wanting to know how they benefit from it. How do you handle that? Well, you know, it's obviously a, a challenge all the time because we serve everyone. So it's, it's, it's something that is, that is a challenge. There's only so much time in the day. There are only so many resources. And so we try and focus on things that serve the broadest cross-section of the constituencies that we're serving. And, and that's an important point, too, because the office is really focusing on not just serving nonprofit arts organizations, but also individual artists and for-profit creative businesses. So that is a pretty broad, there, there's no e, you know, easy answer to this. We just do our best to find programs and services and time to serve them in the best possible way. So some of it, for example, is uh, you know, troubleshooting kind of over the transom kinds of problems or issues that come up all the time. Can you give an example? Sure, I, I, can, I can give more than one because it's the sort of <laughs> stuff that kind of happens all the time. Uh, so the uh, music venue, World Cafe Live, uh, was having some issues related to sort of parking and the parking authority where they had a loading dock area. And when bands came in, they would come in often with a truck or a van that 
after they finished loading had to be parked, and if they parked it in the loading dock, which was the only place they had to park it, it was being ticketed. Uh, and there is a permit that you can get that allows extended loading, but it needs to, it, it's, it's tied to the particular truck, but obviously each band has a different truck. <laughs> so we were able to sort of work out that problem with them, between them and the parking authority, so that their, uh, their trucks would not be ticketed anymore. They were able to get a, a you know, certificate or a permit that, that stayed with the venue, not with the truck. Um, we were, you know, very involved um, in the um, working on on the business privilege tax and business privilege license issue. The so-called the so-called <laughs> blogger gate uh, <laughs> uh, thing that that blew up last year. And uh, not that we alone can sort of solve that problem, but we were very involved. We 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 held an an informational session with people from the tax department, the you know revenue department, who were able to sort of explain what was really going on there. And then we worked internally, again, with our colleagues in revenue as well as city council to try and work on this new uh, approach, this, this, this new legislation that was just passed and signed by the mayor relatively recently that would try and create uh, sort of special treatment of smaller businesses. So those entities that have revenue of less than $100,000 have an exemption. So it sounds to me like a lot of what you described was an ombudsman type role. I think that's a good way to put it. Yeah. But on the other hand, mm -hmm. you also are charged with a budget mm -hmm. for commissioning art. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about that? I know that you've uh, we've been reading about some of your projects, and I believe there's 11 new public commissions coming up. Yeah, I think uh, that sounds like about the right number. Uh, we we operate, and to clarify, we operate the city's percent for art program. Uh, so the city has a, a, an, an ordinance, a legal mandate, that any city-funded construction project has to set aside uh, up to 1% for art. In practice, it, it, is, it is, you know, generally 1%. So there's, uh, there are staff here who work on uh, setting up a, a, you know, competition process, uh, working with the, the client, in this case, which is the the city agency that's doing the work and working with their architect and engineer and team. Let's talk about your budget a little bit more. Sure, sure. We all know we're in a recession. Mm -hmm. Times have been really tough. Mm -hmm. The NEA has cut back all kinds of funding. Mm -hmm. The state of Pennsylvania has cut back funding. Um, how's your budget going? Oh, our budget is not growing. <laughs> it's definitely uh, a challenge. Um, not only has it not been going up, it's going down. I mean, our, our, there are aspects of our investments that uh, include, for example, the Philadelphia Cultural Fund, which is the city's primary vehicle of funding the hundreds of arts organizations that are in the city. And uh, with the Cultural Fund, I will say the, the, the mayor's first budget, which was his pre-recession budget, uh, initially called for a doubling of the funding to the Philadelphia Cultural Fund, having it go from roughly $2 million to $4 million. Um, and unfortunately, once the recession hit within that first budget, which was the fiscal 09 budget, it had to be rolled back to $3 million, uh, which we were then able to protect for a couple of years. And so, frankly, having an increase from $2 million to $3 million in the depths of the recession was a huge accomplishment for the city and a you know, huge commitment, I think, on the mayor's part to recognizing the importance of arts and culture. As the recession continued, Further cuts were required, and now we're a little bit below the two million. You know, Philadelphia has an amazing number of institutions, but uh, one of the things about the visual arts scene is that it's very DIY. That mm -hmm. it's very much from the grassroots up, individual artists doing their own thing and somehow making things happen on their own. And I'm wondering if I'm an individual artist, mm -hmm. um, how do I connect with this office? What does this office do for me? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean. Uh, I, I think that's one thing that we're struggling with right now is sort of how we serve individual artists. You know, uh, we've had conversations, for example, about is there something that we could do, and, and these conversations are ongoing, to create a vehicle for um, health insurance or workers' comp insurance. For example, one thing we've been grappling with right now, even with the you know, mural arts program, is that the, the artists who work with their program are independent contractors. and 
and the city requires that there be workers' comp insurance, and their insurance company requires there be workers' comp insurance, but as individual artists, they don't carry workers' comp insurance, and if they did, the cost is prohibitive to them because they don't have the benefit of scale. They're just a, you know, one person, and so is there something that we could do to kind of aggregate that need and that interest? And so these are all the kinds of, you know, conversations that are going on. One thing that we're working on is uh, working to bring to Philadelphia a program that was um, sponsored by uh, the Knight Foundation uh, that is called CSA, Community Supported Art, uh, which is sort of drawing on the, you know, Community Supported Agriculture program of, 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 you know, operation that's become, that's, you know, big in Philadelphia and big in many cities around the, uh, you know, around the country that's really about sort of buying local and, you know, lo the, you know, locavore movement. And it's sort of looking at how do we create a kind of art version of that. And so the program was uh, developed by a group called Springboard for the Arts in uh, St. Paul that serves individual artists and has been really successful. Um, and basically what it involves is identifying local artists who have an interest in this idea of sort of selling local and also selling to emerging collectors, people who have not been collectors in the past. And so artists are paid a fee to create multiples, and then shares are sold to emerging collectors in the community. So buy a share for $300 and you'll get nine works of art. Um, so these are not expensive works of art. These are often small pieces. It can be, it can be a print, it can be ceramic, similar to the CSA model you pick up your box and you know you have a crate of art uh, that you pick up three times a year. Um, and so we just thought that this was a fantastic idea. We haven't quite finished that process, so I can't reveal. Oh, come on. Uh, I, <laughs> I can't break news here right now. Um, but we're, we're really excited about being able to sort of bring this program to Philadelphia. And that's one small example of that, because that's sort of about bringing art to the people and creating a sort of a new group of people who understand they can buy art and that art can be affordable. One of the problems that the visual arts sector seems to have when it, you're not talking about the museums that have ticket sales mm -hmm. is measuring success. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to quantify success as tickets sold or things of that nature. And we see a lot of success in the visual, art, visual arts sector even though it's not quantifiable by those measurements, like how many people come to openings and things mm -hmm. like that, do you have any way that you can think of to quantify success for alternative galleries or even the commercial galleries? They, you know, they don't sell things like mm -hmm. tickets. Right, right. And so they're, they're lost in all the data collection mm -hmm. that's going on. Yeah, I mean, it is a challenge that we have in, in the arts, and it's something that, w it's not just for Philadelphia, it's something that I think is a larger conversation within the arts, is how you measure success and how you benchmark yourselves. We're grappling with it internally as an agency because there's an effort to really measure what city agencies are doing and how they're making a difference, and how do we do that? Uh, for example, it's not as measurable as if you're trying to stop teen violence or, you know, truancy or you know, other things where you can really measure, you know, where are you at the beginning of this program and what, you know, how did you move the dial? And uh, with, with art, it is more of a challenge. There are some efforts that are underway. Uh, some of this was in the, um, the work that the Greater Philadelphia Cultural Alliance did on engagement, uh, which is looking at how you measure the difference art is making in people's lives, uh, how they feel about art, how they feel about themselves, uh, again, more complicated, more sophisticated, but there are ways of doing it. And there are some researchers like Alan Brown with Wolf Brown who has done some sort of groundbreaking work on this around the country. But that still requires surveying. It still requires asking people questions, but it's a way of getting at not just superficial numbers, how many people walked into your gallery, but did, were they moved? Were they inspired by a work of art that they saw? Uh, there's an effort now underway to sort of try and track that kind of depth of involvement. And then also looking at, you know, the impact of participation in the art. So it's not, it's not just the impact of looking at a work of art, but increasingly people are makers. I mean, there's the whole kind of pro-am movement and people want to make art as well. And it's, it's something that I think is a, is a sort of wonderful trend that we have now of people wanting to not just be passive about art, but wanting to, you know, participate and make art as well.
So I, I, I think that's a good thing, but I, I do think it is a challenge. And, you know, there are some measures. There's a sort of national standard of kind of sales of art galleries, sales of art. Um, Philadelphia is notorious, though, for being poor in sales of art. Yeah, it and, is. And yet mm. it has a very vibrant art scene. Absolutely, and that's why it's an imperfect measure. Well, thank you. On that note, I guess we'll say thank you, Gary Steyer, for talking with us. You're welcome. Art Blog Radio is brought to you by theartblog.org. Thanks to our sponsors, including the Knight Foundation. Also, we want to thank Peter Crimmins, who makes us sound good. He's our editor. And thanks to Eric Biondo for his music. You can download these podcasts at theartblog.org slash radio.